good evening. Good evening. I'm Toby Graham. I'm the University Librarian and Associate Provost here at UGA. And welcome to this very special evening in the life of the University of Georgia Libraries. Tonight, we officially open the Harvard Libraries exhibit on the history of gold and gold mining in Georgia and mark the occasion with a lecture from Dr. Uh, Drew Swanson. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have all of you here. It really is indeed. And, and uh, President Moorhead, thank you for, for being here. We appreciate uh, all you do and all of your leadership uh, and your presence. So, uh, in a sense, the events that led to tonight's program and to the exhibit started with one small coin. One coin that ignited John McMullen's interest and imagination and led to the assembling of a complete set of 62 gold coins struck at the Dahlonega Mint between 1838 and 1861. It's a collection of singular value for our state that John and Marilyn McMullen have generously donated to the university and it forms the cornerstone of this new exhibit. So I think it's fitting that we begin the evening by thanking John and Marilyn McMullen for their generosity and for their vision. Thank you so much. After Dr. Swanson speaks, I'm going to see if I can uh, if I can Im impress John into saying just a few words. But for the moment, I'd also like to thank a few other people. Uh, the, the exhibit draws on the collections of the Harvard Library, of course, and the and the wonderful uh, gold coin exhibit. But we've also borrowed a number of materials from private collections um, and from institutions. And so I wanted to say a word about that. Um, Dr. Joe Gaines, if you'll just stand up one second. Thank you so much for your uh, willingness to, to share with us the Cook and Brothers uh, rifle that's on exhibit and, and the script for the Belfast Mining Company. We've got Gary Doster. Gary, stand up for just a moment. A wonderful friend of the library and, and great collector who shared some uh, currency, including the Pigeon Roost Mining Company currency that's in there. David Vaughn, where are you, David? David is uh, on the library's board of visitors uh, tremendous collector and shared a range of, of, uh, of objects that are that are on exhibit tonight. Bob Harwell, where's Bob? Bob. Uh, so Bob has shared a number of items, but also uh, helped to facilitate with John the, the collection of the gold coin um, that we, the gold, gold, excuse me the gold coin collection we have in the in the exhibit gallery. So thank you so much. And then we have uh, some gold nuggets from the Telus Museum. And I will just add to that. So I know it's a lot of trouble to bring those materials to the library, and it's even more trouble to come back and pick them up. So <laughs> if you decide that that's just too much trouble for you to go to, um, we do have gift forms we can provide to you and take care of that. Uh, won't be any problem. OK, so for, for the exhibit itself, we have a number of sponsors, along with uh, John and Marilyn McMullen. That includes the J.W. Woodruff Center for the Natural History of Georgia, the Draper Center and Archives for the Study of Water Law and Policy. And then for tonight's lecture uh, and for the reception, in addition to the McMullins, uh, the event is co-sponsored by the Wilson Center for the Humanities and the Arts, and they were generous in helping us to get uh, Drew uh, here, and the University of Georgia Press. And I also want to acknowledge the hard work of our director of the Harvard Library, uh, and she may be so hardworking that she's not in the room at the moment. Is Kat Stein in the room? There's Kat. Stand up, Kat. So thank you for your hard work. All right, so now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Drew Swanson is an associate professor of history at Wright State, where he directs the uh, public history concentration and teaches classes in environmental and food public and southern histories. Born in rural Virginia, he's worked as a farmer, a zookeeper, <laughs> a park ranger, uh, before earning a PhD at the University of Georgia. Swanson's research examines the intersections of nature and culture in the American South. Among his publications are two prize-winning books, 
uh, a golden weed tobacco and the environment in the Piedmont South from the Yale Press, and remaking Wormslow Plantation, the environmental history of a low country landscape from our University of Georgia Press. Swanson's research and teaching have received a number of awards, including most recently the Theodore Salutis Memorial Book Prize and Wright State University's Presidential Early Career Achievement Award. So Dr. Swanson, it is our privilege to welcome you back to Athens and to welcome you back to the library. Please come to the podium. Thank you, Toby. Um, how's that for volume? Am I good? I are good, okay. And I've been told I can dim this, so um, maybe I can, maybe I can. All right, we'll run with this. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak in conjunction with um, what looks like a wonderful exhibit. And um, as Toby mentioned, I'm a bulldog, so it is fantastic to be back. Um, at the university and the town for which I have so much affection. In fact, if y'all would like to hire me away from Ohio, um, I'm available. Uh, I want to echo that thanks, especially to, uh, to Catherine Stein, who brought me on board for this, to the Georgia Historical Quarterly that first published some of this work and graciously allowed us to do some reprinting. And uh, of course, to the donors who made this exhibit and other wonderful exhibits um, here at the Special Collections Library possible. Um, as I said, as a graduate student here at Georgia, I spent the better part of two years digging through Hargrit's collections, uh, primarily on the Low Country. And uh, that was, of course, in the old building, which was nice. This new building is fantastic. Um, but during that time, I never imagined that I would ever be back as a guest speaker, so I'm both flattered and honored. <laughs> And I'll also say it's with a, a bit of trepidation that I'm here to give this talk, because I know I'm in a room full of people who probably know Dahlonega and gold coins from Georgia much better than I do. Uh, but I am interested in sort of a particular aspect of Georgia gold's history. So maybe there'll be something uh, for you experts as well that's a little bit different. Uh, but the talk today and the work that the exhibit was based on um, comes out of a current book project. So if you'll indulge me, I think it'll help explain sort of what I'm interested in and what I'll talk about tonight. Uh, and that book project is an environmental history of Appalachia. Uh, so a book about the Southern Mountains, of which this will be just one chapter out of nine. It's sort of a ferociously long book, I'm afraid. Uh, so the book is about the idea of Appalachian exceptionalism and about Appalachian environments and where the two connect. If you're familiar with sort of the history of the Southern Mountains, there was this long-standing idea that Appalachia was this landscape that time and history sort of forgot. As um, one regional reformer famously put it, a landscape of our contemporary ancestors. The idea was, at least this idea that was created by progressive era reformers, uh, again, during a sustained wave of immigration to the United States, uh, was that there was this landscape of sort of Anglo-Saxon speaking, Elizabethan English uh, folks singing old Scottish ballads uh, somewhere deep in the mountains. And that was sort of deeply reassuring to many Anglo-Saxon Americans facing these waves of progressive era immigration. And those old histories, if you're familiar with the Southern Mountains, have been largely debunked by Appalachian historians over the last 25 to 30 years. So we've moved away from that idea. But historians still often portray regional environments, the mountains themselves, in ways that I think are a little problematic. And we still have an idea of the exceptionalism of Appalachian environments and Appalachian nature that this book sort of tangles with. So we're still sort of stuck with the notion uh, that the mountains were exceptional, and not just in the everyday way that each environment is a little bit different from other environments. Uh, so I try to tackle this stereotype through two central arguments. Uh, the first is common sense, but I think worth emphasizing, and that is that there was no Appalachian environment. By that, I don't mean there weren't real plants and real mountains. But there wasn't a single sort of Appalachia. Again, it's common sense, but worth emphasizing. This is a place of a great deal of good diversity. Varying soils, varying slopes, 
forest types. Um, if you went to elementary school in Georgia, most of you probably did, right? You all remember the maps of the different provinces of Georgia, right? So even the mountains in North Georgia are made up of these varying landscapes. Ridges and valleys, the conical peaks of the Blue Ridge, uh, wide rich valleys and spots. So environment matters, but it's, uh, it's not uniform. Right? It doesn't matter in just one way. And the second argument I make, and I think more originally, is that it was actually mountain environments rather than isolating people that connected them. Right? These, um, these Appalachian mountains contained a variety of resources, of commodities, that pulled people into the region and connected the region to other places. Probably sensing this is where gold comes into the story, is one example of this. Right? A product of the mountains that lured people to the region, but also, as I'll show tonight, I think, connected it to other places, like California. Speaking of mountain environments, by the way, who knows where this picture is from? <coughs> It's not. It's, this is a bait and switch. This is a dirty, dirty question. I know. Uh, this is Nevada County, California. So we're seeing some of the technology at work. Um, but I know that's an evil sort of trick slide to start with. <clears throat> so to tell these stories, as I said, each chapter in the book is sort of a case study. It's a micro history of um, one commodity, loosely defined, uh, that connected the region to other places. And I sort of span the time period of Southern Appalachian from, from white settlement to the present. So a very quick list of these, along with an accompanying slide. Uh, I start with the story of, uh, of deer skins, the leather trade, the white trail trade in the South. Look at botanical collectors in Appalachia, folks like Asa Gray, who was the most prominent botanist in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, the story of gold, which will be the subject of today's talk. History of salt, sort of a forgotten Appalachian resource. I'll look at the, look at the salt trade during the Civil War through the story of Salt Bowl, Virginia. Look at transportation as a commodity, especially as it moved coal and iron in southwestern Virginia through the story of Roanoke. Scenery as a commodity through the mountain resort communities. It's too great a slide not to include somewhere. Uh, looking at Grandfather Mountain, North Carolina, for this story. Uh, tobacco. We often think of Appalachian farms as subsistence farms, and in, to some extent they were, but tobacco was long an agricultural commodity that connected the region to distant markets. Look at markets in power multiple forms of power through the story of Oak Ridge. Where of course, we could talk about atomic power, but also the water power of the TBA and uh, the power of federal dollars. And an important resource in Appalachia that we often don't think about that way, especially from the mid 20th century forward. And of course, coal. It's hard to tell Appalachia's story without coal. And so uh, the last full chapter in the book is the story uh, centered around the Martin County, Kentucky coal sludge spill of 2000. How many of you have heard about this spill? Yeah. I see a handful of hands, but probably not as many as should, based on the sort of scope of the disaster. This was a, a waste <coughs> spill that was 30 times larger than the Exxon Valdez, and uh, about three times larger than the BP Deepwater Horizon Gulf spill. Right. And it's a terrestrial spill, so it's all still scattered somewhere across eastern Kentucky, western West Virginia, and along the bottom of the Ohio River. I'm not sure how far it ended up, but somewhere past Cincinnati. And then the epilogue of the book, which is sort of another story in and of itself, is about sort of selling the idea of exoticism in Appalachia. And I do that through endangered and invasive species. So sort of paired stories of an endangered salamander, this is not the salamander, um, and an invasive insect that interacts with it, in this case, the balsam woolly adelgid. So each one of these stories is meant to stand on its own, but they're all linked through this emphasis on the ways that nature connected Appalachia uh, to the outside world and vice versa. So today, uh, as promised, there's gonna be some gold in this talk. It's not all bait and switch, like that first slide. Uh, today, I do want to dive into that story of Appalachian gold um, through this sort of context of connection. 
So many of you are probably familiar with the sort of discovery myth, the origin myth of gold in Georgia. Uh, it starts with uh, the story of Benjamin Parks. So Parks was a farmer who lived near the Chesapeake River, modern day Lumpkin County. And uh, according to the story, one day in 1828, when Parks was out hunting, or maybe he was driving cattle back from Salt Lick, depends on which version of the story you read, uh, he stumbles over a rock. We can imagine he cursed. And uh, bending over to take a look at it, he noticed that it was flecked with gold. Parks, of course, tried to tell no one about this, find more gold himself, uh, but word soon leaked out. Now, um, if any of you are from Villarica, you're probably saying nasty things about me saying this is the origin story for Georgia gold. Uh, there are many sort of competing claims for the first discovery of gold in the state. Uh, for other discoverers or at other sites in North Georgia or in a different year, even if it's the park story. But it's the park story that's become the one um, celebrated in popular memory. And so we have a state historical marker that tells a story very similar to the one that I just told you. <clears throat> Whoever and wherever and whenever gold was first discovered, uh, a substantial gold rush began in Georgia in the very late 1820s. Uh, it's important to note here, though, that there have been smaller gold rushes in the Mountain South and the Piedmont South before this, on a much smaller scale in Maryland, in Virginia as well, and then a fairly substantial rush just a few years before this in the western edge of the North Carolina Piedmont. The Georgia rush is bigger, uh, but there was some precedent for this. Uh, something like 10,000 miners stream into the Georgia Gold District in the first year after word gets out. Of course, much of this was still officially Cherokee land. Uh, as we all know, the state of Georgia moved pretty quickly to secure miners' interests. This, of course, culminates in the famous uh, tussle between Andrew Jackson and the Supreme Court, and ultimately in the removal of most of the Cherokee along the Trail of Tears in 1838. And of course, it's in this context uh, that the Georgia Gold Rush is most often taught in American history classes and even within um, Georgia itself. Pretty quickly, Georgia will auction off what amounts to the northwestern corner of the state in either agricultural or mining tracts. The mining tracts, uh, which were 40 acre plots, and you can see um, an example, a sample from a much larger lottery map here. Uh, there are 35,000 of these 40-acre tracts, and 133,000 Georgians register for the land lottery. Right? This is a very popular thing. <clears throat> uh, there's a great deal of speculative fever that involves this lottery and this auctioning. There are rumors of especially prized tracts, right? Words leak out in the paper. You want lot such and such. And often, as soon as the lottery is conducted, these change hands through multiple speculators. Um, there are newspaper accounts in some faraway Savannah, a particular lot selling for $100,000 in 1832. A lot of money. <laughs> Based on uh, the gold that's imagined to be there, um, and in some cases, was. Now the mining on these tracks, at least the earliest mining, followed relatively simple forms. Uh, prospectors would dig in alluvial gravel, the stuff that's located pretty close uh, to the river and the stream courses themselves, and um, used pans and rockers, often made from hollowed out trees, to separate gold from sand and gravel and stone. And this is the, the classic prospecting that's most often recreated for tourists or portrayed in gold rush literature. But an important point here is that this pretty quickly evolved into more complex endeavors, right? into business in sort of the modern sense of the term. So uh, within the first couple of years of the gold rush, there's some limited tunnel mining, um, at least shallow into banks with some support of the tunnels themselves and so on. Uh, there's the use of multi-stage rockers and sluices, and more complex machinery for washing gold, and the use of um, crushing gold-bearing ore by substantial stamping machines that work multiple cast-iron stamps to break up quartz rock and extract more gold as well. 
You can even find antebellum accounts as early as the late 1830s of primitive dredge boats being used in North Georgia, and even experiments with diving bells as well. So already a pretty far step beyond the sort of pan stereotype uh, that often is mentioned. And this took financing. <clears throat> so outside capital is important in Georgia gold mining from the early years as well. Uh, some of this comes from within the lowland portions of the state, but it comes from other regions as well, and some of this financing is international too. So some of the larger mines in Georgia attract New York financing in the late 1830s and the early 1840s. Um, one of the North Carolina mines, gold mining still going on in the, the Western Piedmont of North Carolina at the same time, is operated by an English company and uh, mainly worked, or at least with a high percentage of the laborers are Welsh or Cornish. They had experience mining um, in the UK and, and are now mining in North Carolina. And also from planters. Investment comes from lowland agricultural enterprises as well. We often don't connect gold mining to the state's sort of cotton economy. But for many Georgia landowners, um, this was a way to diversify, to use a modern term, their holdings, if you will. To put slave labor from uh, their cotton plantations to work during the winter in property that they might own elsewhere. Uh, so, as I said, gold sort of rarely portrayed as an integral part of the state's agricultural economy, but in many ways it was. Sorry, Gold Hill Works in North Carolina, that mine I was mentioning. And a classic example of the ties to the plantation economy, of course, is through John C. Calhoun. Uh, Calhoun, who wore many hats over the course of his life, he was vice president, a senator, representative, secretary of state, secretary of war. Uh, owned one of the most substantial mines in North Georgia, uh, worked by slaves from some of his other plantations, and uh, managed at least for a time by his son-in-law, Thomas Clemson, for whom Clemson University is named. Now, if you've been through the exhibit, uh, you've already seen that this, even this early wave of mining carried some pretty dire environmental consequences. <coughs> Observers who traveled into the Gold District remarked sort of with equal frequency about the wealth and energy of this place. That was always there. But they also remarked quite frequently that this work was ugly. <laughs> they used that term. It wasn't pretty, even if it was necessary in their minds. Uh, so they quite often mentioned uh, timbering for mine operations. Uh, they mentioned the hasty erection of shanty towns to fowls feed and entertain miners, and they wrote about the piles of displaced dirt that dotted the landscape. Uh, as one of these commenters noted in the, uh, the second quote on the slide there, uh, the whole population is engaged in digging for gold in the face of the country for many miles presents the appearance of new-made graves. <clears throat> the South's most famous writer of the age, William Gilmore Sims, also seized upon this motif in his 1834 novel, Guy Rivers. How many of you have read Guy Rivers? <laughs> if you haven't, you're not missing out on that. <laughs> no offense to any Sim scholars in the room. It's not his, not his greatest work, uh, but it is a fascinating one for its descriptions of the gold country. Uh, so Sims writes about this um, sort of ugly frontier place. Sims's big concern is that nature, not that nature is being defiled, but that nature worked in this way, sort of defiling people, if you will, stripping away the culture they'd earned in the Piedmont and on the coast, their sort of gracious upbringings, and turning them into savages, if you will. So like many of Sims's stories, there's a, there's a gentleman from the coastal south who goes to some frontier portion of the south, in this case, the Gold District, um, manages to escape by the skin of his teeth and sort of happily returns to a more civilized portion of the South. So Sims was tapping into this sort of idea about what gold mining was doing to nature um, that played out more broadly in the frontier South as well. This mining was important for the national economy to change gears here a little bit in a way that isn't often emphasized. Georgia gold mattered, not just to the miners who made money, but also to the nation more broadly. Uh, 
The discovery of gold in Georgia came in a moment in American history when currency was shaky. So I was so happy to see the paper money on display early in the exhibit uh, because it ties in perfectly here. Uh, Banknotes at the time were notoriously suspect. You looked at all of them with sort of a squinty eye and a bit of suspicion. Uh, it was a time when uh, historian Stephen Mem has called us a nation of counterfeiters. And I understand that he's going to give a talk on that here in a couple of months. Uh, so paper money was propped up by sort of wildly fluctuating land values tied to complex speculations in many instances. Of course, in Georgia, sort of the Yazoo land fraud and the Pine Barren speculation were still sort of echoing in people's uh, confidence in paper notes and banks in particular. Uh, so many pundits of the time argued that bringing more specie, more precious metal, especially gold, into the economy would help stabilize American finances. It doesn't work out that well. And there's still a big financial panic in 1837 that Georgia gold doesn't um, forestall. But it did provide some backbone to the nation's currency. Things could have been worse. Something, um, it depends on who's doing the estimating. But something like $40 million, at least according to one historian, worth of gold went to public and private mints and uh, elsewhere during the period, before the Civil War. This included um, public mints in Charlotte and Dahlonega and important private mints in Gainesville and uh, in Rutherford to North Carolina. Uh, exactly what this is worth today is difficult to, um, to calculate. Just to give you an idea of how widely this fluctuates, um, it could be the equivalent of about $1.3 billion. We're just talking about the consumer price index, or $388 billion if you're talking about the portion of sort of the national um, productive economy. So, either way, a tremendously important resource. It would soon be dwarfed by Western gold fields, uh, but it was crucially important for its time. And then it all ends in 1849, right? The California gold rush. Uh, the promise of those richer western fields lured miners away by the thousands. Um, of course, many of them took Georgia techniques and equipment with them west. And many of them had been miners here. And uh, they didn't just sort of forget what they had learned in Georgia when they headed to places like California and then to the Rockies in the 1850s with the Front Range gold rush. Um, Denver itself, the two mining camps that merged to form Denver, one of them was named Zoraria, after Georgia Zoraria, and made up largely of Georgia miners. Uh, so as I said, this is sort of often where histories of the Georgia rush stop, especially if you don't live in northern Georgia. Uh, the story rarely continues. Uh, but of course, as we know, there are periodic revivals, especially in the late 1850s, or at least that's the period that interests me in many ways. And a way to get into this story of these efforts in the late antebellum period, I think, is through this very fascinating guy, William Phipps Blake. Um, seen later in life here, not many pictures of Blake. Uh, this is about the best one uh, that I could bring up. Blake's born in New York City in 1826, educated at Yale, studies under an eminent professor of chemistry named Benjamin Silliman. Uh, from a young age, he's sort of a boy genius. He dabbles in everything. He patents a spring-assisted fish hook. He writes about fossils. He publishes technical guides on the properties of metals. He dabbles in theories of continental drift and geologic uplift. And these <coughs> things were sort of high modern science. And um, he travels west as a geological surveyor after he graduates from Yale. So he's part of an important geologic government survey in California in the 1850s, and also part of surveying potential routes for a transcontinental railroad. Uh, not the winning route, but the route that uh, was, was hopefully going to be established from Memphis. And this is a portion of a map that Blake drew as a part of that survey. <clears throat> and while Blake is in California doing this work, uh, he becomes very interested in California gold mining. <laughs> works as an engineer, a hydraulic engineer, in these western gold mines. So to frame this work, the California rush starts much like the Georgia rush. 
The very early mining involves pans and rockers and sluices, but pretty quickly, just like Georgia, it becomes more capital intensive, more dependent on investors and machinery, and especially on hydraulic mining. That's the ultimate expression of this. So hydraulic mining was um, diverting water from a stream course uh, through a set of flumes or canals downhill, and the fall of that water, thanks to gravity, builds up enough pressure or head that when you run it through an narrow, increasingly narrow hose, you have a powerful stream of water that you can use to tear stuff apart, especially stuff made out of dirt. If you ever left your garden hose on full blast aimed at your yard, imagine that sort of a thousand times over. And that becomes the most sort of important form of California mining pretty quickly. Uh, the most famous place to see this, at least today, is at a California State Park, Malakoff Diggins. Uh, and this is a, a historic sign at that place. Of course, you're seeing the former surface of the earth up there and the amount that hydraulic mining has cut the surface down. So using sort of the tremendous power of water and gravity. It's tremendously productive in terms of producing gold, tremendously destructive in terms of what it does uh, to everything else. <clears throat> By the late 1850s, Blake had headed back east. He sets up an engineering and consulting office in New York City, and um, he makes a career, at least for a time, from trying to renew interest in Appalachian gold mine. So Blake's belief, at least on paper, was that if you took these California techniques, especially hydraulic mining, and you went back to the gold grounds of places like North Georgia, there was a lot of gold waiting to be produced by these techniques. <coughs> so um, Blake's work sort of followed a model. He would find an interested landowner in North Georgia, perhaps one who had an abandoned or underdeveloped mining property. He would survey the mine, um, sometimes with another engineer or an assayer, and then publish the results of that survey in New York or Boston or Philadelphia um, to try to drum up sort of potential investors. Um, use that money to purchase shares in a mining company, and um, there'd be some in, him, in it for him as well, of course, too. Uh, and that that money would launch hydraulic mining operations in Appalachia. Maybe the most widely reprinted of these prospective pamphlets is this one, the gold placers in the vicinity of Veronica. There are multiple versions of this for other parts of North Georgia as well, put out by Blake and others. Now Blake, Blake is pretty clear about what this would mean for the North Georgia landscape. Um, he'd been in California, after all. He'd seen it at work. Um, so as he says here in this prospectus, Basically, this water is great for washing away big chunks of the hillside, acres of earth, to paraphrase what he says in that quote. The nice thing he goes on to say after this quote is that uh, thanks to the fact that North Georgia is steep um, and has abundant water, all the stuff that's washed away will not be the mine's problem, it will be someone else's problem. <laughs> that's a great thing from his perspective. Uh, the problem, of course, in California is that at the same moment in time, lawsuits are emerging between downstream landowners affected by washing. If you've ever been to the sort of Sacramento River Delta, much of that delta is what used to be in the Sierras. <laughs> so Blake says uh, this will work in Georgia too, right? especially for miners. He's pretty successful in raising a good deal of money in the late 1850s. Um, exactly how much has been hard to pin down. I feel like I'm getting closer, but I, I, it's hard to get firm figures. Uh, Blake seems to have produced several million dollars through the share, uh, the, the sale of shares for companies like uh, the Yahula River and Cane Creek Hydraulic Mining Company, Chester T Hydraulic Company, the Auraria Mines, the Southern Gold Company, uh, the Nakuchi Hydraulic Mining Company. Blake has ties to all of these operations. Each one of those was capitalized at something like half a million dollars. They don't all fully subscribe, some do during the period. It's also important to note that this isn't just the story of Blake. It's not one guy sort of doing all of this. Uh, Blake is one figure among numerous Northeastern engineers and speculators doing the same sort of thing. 
There's a guy named James Hodge in Brooklyn uh, who's influential. The state assayer of Massachusetts, Charles Jackson, has a side business doing this as well. Um, and the Albert and Raymond Company in New York and others too. And of course, they're, they're accompanied by um, capitalist speculators in places like New York and Boston, as well as um, southern landowners too. So there are a great deal of people interested in this process. In the early years, I think the most money is made in the water itself, at least in 1858, 59, 1860. Uh, so the water companies themselves that are organized to move water from somewhere uphill to the land or to the gold tracks themselves uh, really, I think, produce the most profit in the early years. So they sell water by the acre foot. This is a Blake sketch, again, from that gold placer showing the sort of aqueduct that you might need to build to move water over some of the terrain in North Georgia. And an image of the Yahula Ditch, as it was called, uh, one of the early canals uh, moving water to the mine districts themselves. <clears throat> Many of these water companies own their own claims, too. They often rented them out, and so they sort of made a value-added product they had these mining tracks that were worth something, but by bringing water to them, um, they could rent them out or use them themselves in a much more profitable way and sell their water if they're renting them out. So sort of kill two birds with one stone. So these hydraulic mines in Georgia do get underway, at least a few of them, before the Civil War. Most of this is happening in 1859, 1860. Uh, but some of them do become operational before the Civil War. When we think about hydraulic mining, if we're familiar with it in Georgia, we usually think of the post-war period, but this is happening before the Civil War starts. It's happening in North Carolina too. In fact, the first hydraulic mining operations in the East to come online, uh, come online in Western North Carolina, near that Gold Hill mine. <clears throat> so again, not just isolated to one place and one thing. <coughs> The Civil War cuts these endeavors short. Um, it's rare to say sort of anything good about what the Civil War did for the Georgia environment. I'm not sure I'm about to say that either. I won't make that claim. But it does put a halt uh, to hydraulic mining um, and the sort of environmental destruction that accompanied it for multiple reasons. And the war cuts those, um, those financial connections with those northern investors for a time, so the flow of money dries up. The flow of miners themselves is reduced to a trickle, and a lot of them uh, enlist, they volunteer, or later on they're conscripted, so there were fewer miners. And then as the machinery itself begins to break down, um, southern industrial capacity, right, uh, its manufacturing capacity was turned toward the war effort. There wasn't much left over to repair a hydraulic gun or so on. Uh, so for the first couple of years of the war, you can find continued mining in North Georgia and efforts to continue these hydraulic operations, but it really does, pardon the pun, dry up to a trickle and is sort of killed uh, by the war itself for a time. And there'll be renewed efforts after the war, during Reconstruction, again around the turn of the 20th century. There's a later image of hydraulic mining on a relatively small scale from Lumpkin County. And uh, a much larger operation, the Consolidated Gold Mining Company, financed by Ohio Capital, um, that gets going around the turn of the century. <clears throat> so, of course, this Georgia gold rush is a, a long, drawn-out, multi-stage thing. It's not just sort of a rustic frontier movement. So I think there are a couple of central points I'd like to emphasize here, and then I'll open it up to questions, or at least things I'll suggest are important about this story from my perspective. The first is that that idea of um, antebellum Georgia gold mining as this rustic frontier endeavor, while not completely wrong, is only a little part of sort of the true story of gold mining before the Civil War in the South. The complexity of early mining, the machinations of Blake and his counterparts, they show us that this mining was what we would call both quite industrial and quite capitalist. It's a loaded term, I know. Uh, but that's a different sort of picture of what this gold rush was than we often get in the sort of survey histories. 
I'd also suggest that we can see Appalachian gold mining as sort of a precursor to later industrial exploitation of the region, most famously coal. So this is not to say that gold mining in Dahlonega on a straight path leads to coal mining in southern West Virginia. Uh, what I would suggest, though, is that this way of thinking about Appalachian natural resources has a longer history than we sometimes imagine. It just doesn't just begin post-Civil War. You can find elements of it, outside capital and investment, the use of scientific uh, expertise and engineers, promotional tracks, and so on. You can find that in places like the Georgia gold mines, but also in salt mining in southwestern Virginia, lead and iron works in Virginia and East Tennessee, and so on. They sort of follow this template that will be much bigger and more destructive post-Civil War. But it's in place, I think, pretty firmly pre-Civil War. And so I think Georgia Gold's story is important for our national stories in those ways. That's probably a good place for me to stop and open it up for questions. I was told we have about 10, 12 minutes for questions before we move to the next segment. Yes? Do you know where the hydraulic mining technique was developed? Was it developed here and then moved west? Or did they develop there and came back here? Uh, so this sort of hydraulic use of water um, engineers had played around with in multiple forms. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, when you go through the exhibit, there's some um, later motion picture imagery of this, so you can sort of see it at work as a part of the exhibit. Um, so the engineering for this was in place. Really the pioneering use of it for gold mining, as I understand it, is in California. So there's not much use of the guns in Georgia until they've done it in California, and it's brought back in the late 1850s. Um, it becomes somewhat popular in Australia as well. Uh, bigger story than, than we're telling here, uh, but in the early Australian rush, there's some use of, of hydraulic techniques. And um, there's actually a lot of international communication about this stuff. So it's not just, um, not just stories of California that come back to the South, stories of, of Australia as well, and then later on South Africa and, and so on. So the, the gold economy, especially as the century progresses, becomes very much an international one. Yes? What ended gold mining? I think that's sort of an international answer as well. So gold mining comes back late 19th century, as this consolidated mine suggests. Um, in fact, depending on who's doing the estimating, again, um, maybe the peak year in actual gold production in Georgia is maybe 1899, 1900, 1901, somewhere in there, in terms of the ounces removed in a single year. Uh, but there are a lot of bigger, richer international gold fields by that point in time. So you had a rush in the Dakotas in the 70s, and then the Klondike, very end of the century, new discoveries in Australia, South Africa comes online, and so Georgia Gold, um, at least with the labor situation in North Georgia, wasn't tremendously competitive. It, um, the gold doesn't go away in some ways. Much of it's been removed, but there's still, still some there. Um, it's not gone, it's just the fact that the, the world has changed. Is there any number on how much gold came out of the long payday? <laughs> so, there's some debate over this, because it doesn't all go to mints. Um, so Otis Young Jr. has, um, I think, maybe done the most broadest, at least, calculation of this. And his estimate that, and I can't remember the ounces, his estimate is, um, is $40 million worth at the time. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, the estimate is that from 1849 to 1860 in California, it's about $600 million worth. So the California rush is much larger and happens over a more compressed time frame. Um, as I sort of suggest here, I think the important thing is that when Georgia starts, it's almost the only game in town. And so the, the gold matters more then um, than if it had been discovered in the 1850s when California was sort of already on the line. Yes? Um, this might be a bit beyond the scope of your work, I think more of a social history question, but uh, what sort of economic opportunity did this create for women, especially the early part of the rush prior to California? Because I know like with California uh, through Susan B. Johnson's work that he, there were no women out there, they had all sorts of economic opportunity 
here with so much close to already so a lot of already settled areas? In some ways, I think the story is, and I haven't done a whole lot of research on this. I'll preface it with that. Um, so now that I've said I know almost nothing about it, I'll boldly wade in and, and give you an opinion. <laughs> uh, I think the situation in the early years, at least, was pretty similar. Um, I say that because there's a sort of an enormous endeavor in missionary work into North Georgia. So one of the sort of the most entertaining articles about the place come from these, um, these Christian journals published in the Northeast in particular. Right? So uh, this work to send missionaries into the North Georgia gold fields, they write about them as the sort of rough and tumble frontier place that they'll write California is a couple decades later. And they often sort of um, complain about what women are doing in this place. Right? Um, they're too close or, heaven forbid, running a saloon. Um, they're in a house of ill repute or so on. Uh, they're making money. right? <laughs> Uh, they're making money, so it suggests that it's the same sort of um, social placement that California is in a way. Uh, but beyond that sort of suggestive thing, I don't know that I can offer much more. Uh, there's also um, sort of interesting African American history here that isn't often related. Uh, there's a scholar, David Williams, who has done some of this. But besides him, he's really the, the expert on this. Um, of course, as I said slave labor was an important part of this gold mining, um, especially in bigger operations before the Civil War, uh, which doesn't always make its way into our histories of the region. And we also have some accounts of um, free African Americans establishing their own small mines, even though that was officially against Georgia law in the early rush. Uh, the sale of these gold tracks to have free African Americans was forbidden by law, uh, but we do have some records that it did happen. So like any place where there's the potential of a lot of money to be made quickly, um, there are these sort of social opportunities and niches that I think people can, can exploit in a way. Yes? Is there any factual basis for the um, novel, Scott uh, Hole Baker, basically in Lincoln County, I guess, mm -hmm. in that area? Um, you know, I don't know if there is, if, if Caldwell, that sort of a firm factual. Gold in the area. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If anyone does, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know. But I, I don't know if it's grounded in a particular sort of real story or if it's just um, just sort of his imagination. I think I saw a. Yes. How much gold did the Cherokee ever mine? According to the early stories, none. Okay. Um, but we got to take that with a grain of salt, I think. Um, so the early folks, in fact, Blake has a little section on this in his um, pamphlet that I showed there uh, when he's relating the history of this place. He says that the, the Cherokee never discovered gold, or if they did, they never used it. Uh, the evidence that he suggests is that um, locally he didn't know of any ornamentation um, made from gold. Of course, you can find some evidence, I think, of that at other sites around the southeast. Um, and it's pretty self-serving, right? To say that the Cherokee didn't know about the gold was to say you're not taking something they were using. Mm -hmm. Never mind the land. Uh, so yeah. I, don't, I don't think it was extensive, but, um, but the early miners sort of argue certainly that this is their discovery um, and hence legitimizing their claim. But they did not have a um gold jewelry and things like that. that yeah, so far as I know, culture. no sort of organized mining endeavor, certainly, mm -hmm. um, in the way that, that early prospectors understood. I guess I shouldn't have said mining, but yeah. use of gold. Yes? Can we talk about the U.S. myth and the other myths and how that came to be? Uh, that's something I frankly don't know a whole lot about. So hopefully <laughs> that's something we can be told about in a little bit. I think that... To me, the interesting sort of mint story out of the South was um, the importance for a time of private mints. So uh, the Dahlonega Mint, of course, comes about a few years after the original um, gold strike. And it was um, sort of intended to be a convenience in a way. So gold flowing out of the region before this point in time, in the very early years of the rush, would go to, to Philadelphia, um, in particular, mainly Philadelphia. And um, to establish the mint in Charlotte, because there's a mint in Charlotte created about the same time, and in Dahlonega, uh, was to lure more of this, this gold into the mint 
I think, was the real purpose. Because a lot of it had gone um, to secure finances from other places. It had gone in the form of dust to purchase supplies for the miners and so on. Um, and about the same time, there are two private mints that pop up. Uh, I think I mentioned them in the talk. One in Gainesville, Georgia, and one in Rutherfordton, North Carolina. So they're these sort of, um, they're not shadow mints because they're very much legitimate organizations, but they're created as these sort of parallels uh, to the Charlotte and the uh, Dahlonega mints. And the, what they create, the, the coins that they stamp out and they do bars as well, um, those are accepted as sort of legal tender uh, real money, if you will, uh, for a time too. So they're not illegitimate, they are private, and that's sort of a, I don't know, a weird thing for us to wrap our, our heads around, if you will. Yes? As, you, as a historian, have you ever speculated on what would have happened if just so those men had found that gold? <laughs> Might be giving this talk in a different language. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we'd have probably, as a nation, taken Georgia along with California and Texas and so on, eventually. They're, they're actually looking for it. That's the reason for their... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I dare say we'd have a very similar sort of colonial story that we see in other places, um, where, in this case, Georgia, uh, Georgia gold becomes like tobacco or like rice or that sort of thing, and it helps drive a... And maybe we have a colony of Georgia before 1733, if that happens. I don't know. Yes? I'm thinking that... Um... Well, I think that was the tension, was that the Confederacy desperately needed gold, um, but also needed the other things that it took to mine effectively. So you see, um, as I said, sort of attempts to continue this mining early in the war, and in fact they do. Um, as late as late 1861, you can find a hydraulic hose company trying to organize and still sell shares, so they're optimistic that they can start in the war. Um, but I think it's kind of like you, you need money to make money, the old sort of rubric. I think it's the separation from northern capital that does some of it. Um, it's that labor shortage that I mentioned. But I think the machinery part of it is especially important. Um, so you just don't have the surplus um, industrial manufacturing capacity in the South uh, to repair or replace or expand these operations when you so desperately need it to make as many guns as you can. So there, there is this tension, and of course later in the war this becomes uh, really close to the front, right? So the war itself, uh, the battle lines themselves sort of intrude into the region and put all this stuff into jeopardy. So there are efforts, but I think the, the material that you needed to really make it happen become more and more difficult to pull together as the war goes on. And of course, people like Blake stop being involved, right? So all of a sudden, this is in a different country, at least from some people's perspective. And so um, the connections, the intellectual connections begin to break down in some ways as well. And I think we've hit the 7 o'clock mark. So I think I'm supposed to turn it over to the, the next stage of our... Okay. Now. Thank you. I thought that was, that was outstanding and, and quite illustrative of how we can use uh, gold and the history of gold mining and, and, uh, and the production of coins and all of that as a point of departure to teach so many different historical themes. And so we're grateful to have the opportunity to do that with the uh, exhibit and to share that with the UGA students and with the general public. But we'll also be having hundreds of uh, K-12 students coming through uh, the galleries through the course um, of, of the fall semester, and we're pleased to be able to do that uh, as well. So at this point, um, John, would, would you mind coming up and just saying a, a few words uh, to us about uh, how you got started down this path and anything else that uh, you'd like to share with us? In the issue of how much gold was in North Georgia, it's kind of interesting that it's about a, uh, 120 to 1. So if there was $40 million worth of gold, it's probably $5 billion in today's money. Um, in connection with having children, I'm a coin collector, and coin collectors are not really kind of normal people. We have <laughs> But the American Numismatic Association 
has created a medallion, and this particular one has a picture of the Richard B. Russell Library on it. And we provided 500 of these that will go to uh, young people as they come through uh, this fall and give them a subscription to the ANA magazine. They'll get a digital subscription and a paper subscription to that magazine. Uh, we always worry about we're a dying hobby because you really got to be peculiar to look through coins. Um, they had the plot, the uh, thing about Mr. Clemson. Just remember, Clemson was founded with Georgia Gold. <laughs> uh, Buddy Stone, my longtime friend, and sitting back there. And Buddy, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I didn't know how we got the idea, but we decided there was going to be gold in a creek that was in a wooded area at the corner of Bloomfield and Cloverhurst. <laughs> so we had heard in science that you could pass sand with gold in it over a bed of mercury, and the gold would sink in the mercury. The sand would. So we built a box, and we had a little area to put mercury in, and there's a part of the exhibit in there. They did this in North Georgia. Now, how do you extract the gold from the mercury? <laughs> you go to your mother's kitchen and you get one of her best pans and you boil it. That is a poisonous gas that would have killed everybody, <laughs> including Buddy and me. <laughs> and not one drugstore in Athens would sell us the mercury. <laughs> and that's why we're still here today. <laughs> <laughs> One other little anecdotal story, and this will tell you how peculiar uh, coin collectors are. Uh, about 20 years ago, I started going to banks looking for 50 cent pieces. And I was doing that because until 1964, they were 90% silver, and then the, the, about five more years, they were 40% silver. And Marilyn, bless her heart, she had literally been in the car at hundreds of banks <laughs> all over this country where I'd go in and say, do you have any half dollar rolls, half dollar coins. And when Bob Harwell helped me accumulate these coins, I said, there's one criteria. Uh, I've got some half dollars that you've got to agree to take <laughs> in part payment. I had $35,000 <laughs> that weighs over a ton. <laughs> And Bob, if you remember, the first time we took him to the bank, the first thing we did was we dropped one of the bags out of the back of the car. <laughs> and here we are spending 30 minutes chasing these half dollars all over the place. But President Mohead thanks the University of Georgia for having this wonderful facility that stores the historical artifacts and the history of the great state of Georgia. Because without this, there'd be no place for this collection. And, and the history of gold in Georgia is significant. And uh, just keep in mind that uh, what we did to the Cherokee Indians came out of probably out of the gold rush in Georgia. I think if it hadn't happened, it, I doubt if we would have ever expelled the Cherokee Indians from Georgia. But thank you all for being here. And thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. <laughs>